Well, I wanted to start just by saying thank you to Camilla and the organizing committee for inviting me to come and speak here today. Um, this is a picture I wanted to show you about the history of farming. I did, in fact, grow up on a family farm in Scotland. I don't know if you had a little pointer thing on this or not. That's me, actually, over towards the left back in the 1980s. So you can see that farm decision making and the future of farming is something that actually is quite important to me. Two of the boys in that picture are now running farms of their own because my parents are still involved in running theirs. So as Peter said, what I've been doing for the last 10 years is looking particularly at agro-environmental decision making. So what I'm going to do is to start off by talking a bit about how farmers sort of see the environment and understand it in relation to their farms. I'm going to talk a bit about what we've called the triggering change cycle, which effectively argues that there are particular points in the life course of a farm where farms are more likely to make a major change in trajectory and how that works. And then I'm going to talk a bit about some of the work that we've been doing on new entrants funded by the European Commission at the end. So in terms of how farmers see the environment, obviously there are a lot of different types of farmers producing a lot of different commodities. So in one sense, it's not possible to generalize into they see it like this. But at the same time, there's been a lot of research done that's demonstrating that farmers have a particular way of understanding and valuing the environment that tends to be quite different from what your academics, for instance, would necessarily value. And a lot of it has to do with the link between a productive farm, and therefore a profitable farm, and the environment. And so this example, for instance, what you see here, obviously, is somebody with a cereal farm. And so a cereal farmer is going to be kind of culturally oriented towards valuing and appreciating landscapes that demonstrate his or her competence as a cereal farmer. So they like to see nice, even fields of cereals. For instance, you notice it's all the same height in that picture. There's no weeds in it. The lines are very straight. And that demonstrates a very competent farmer who's able to produce high yields off of his or her farm. As a result, you find them valuing landscapes like this one. It's actually one that I personally find quite appealing. I love to see round bales and fields. And that's probably because I grew up on a farm where we grew barley. And so when you see these bales in the fields, what you're seeing is that the harvest is just about done, the barns are full, you're set for winter, you've got plenty of bedding. But that's not what goes through my mind when I look at a field full of bales. I just look at a field full of bales and think, I like the way that looks. You see this also in machinery advertisements. So that's what's going on down in this corner where you have this brand new machinery. But again, you've got these long, even, straight lines. And you've got the environmental bits kind of in the background. You've got some nice mountains. You've maybe got some trees in along the edges. But by and large, what they like to see is a farmed landscape. The next one, if you're dealing, for instance, with someone who's producing livestock, then what they'd like to see in a landscape is probably going to be a bit different, but equally linked to what a productive landscape looks like. So if you look at the pastures in these pictures, for instance, you'll notice that there's not a lot of weeds. You'll notice that there's not a lot of poaching or dirt. It's all grass. It's green grass. These look like well-managed pasture fields, and they've got good quality livestock in them. You can see the, <laughs> the dairy cows up in the top is exactly how I was taught to show cattle. When I was in farming, you want their heads up, but you don't almost ever get that in the field, but you want one leg back, for instance, demonstrating a nice straight back and nice depth and that sort of thing. So what this is demonstrating is the different kinds of landscapes that farmers like to see. Now, why does that matter? Well, what it matters is that when you introduce something like agro-environmental schemes, where, which include things that look to a farmer, like producing weeds along this field margin, when those were initially introduced, this did not look like good farming to the farmers that were involved. And the argument, certainly coming from the literature, is that although there's an economic benefit to doing this, you get money from engaging in the schemes, there's also a cultural cost because it looks to your neighbors, and farmers do an awful lot of looking at what their neighbors do, like you've got a field full of weeds. Now, what we're seeing is that's obviously changed over the last 20 years as more and more farmers have come into this. And they've started to look at these field margins, for instance, and go, oh, oh that fits in an agro-environmental scheme. Oh, OK. And so they understand the landscape differently. But that's why there was this initial kind of resistance to agro-environmental schemes. You also see ones like up at the top. That's probably an organic farming field. And so farmers can look at that and go, oh, well, that's Joe. He's an organic farmer. Actually, that doesn't look too bad, given he can't have put any pesticides on it. 
are insecticides in this particular case. So you get this kind of negotiation of what a good agriculture environment looks like. So where I'm taking this now is into this idea of triggering change. What I've been talking about has a lot to do with path dependency. So to give you a bit of an overview, I'm just going to take you through the whole cycle off the start and then come back and go through each individual stage and what that means for trying to influence change. This was research that was originally done on organic and conventional farmers, so areas where there were actually a lot of organic farmers already. And so a lot of the people in this particular study were converting to organic farming, but they weren't all necessarily. Some of them were getting into other forms of diversification, for instance, so renting out buildings on farms or that kind of thing. So it is actually an approach that goes beyond just environmental change and into a lot of other changes on the farm. The basic argument is that farms will generally continue along the same sort of trajectory, so it's not that they're not progressing, they will actually be investing in new equipment or heading along that direction until something happens. And it's not normally a one-off event, although sometimes it is. It's normally kind of a series of things happening over time because farmers don't make change in a hurry for very good reasons. That will make them start thinking about, wait a minute, I need to do something different. And that's when you end this, enter into this period of active assessment thinking about, okay, what are my options? What can I do within the limits of my capabilities and, and options? They'll then implement that, which is actually a fairly vulnerable stage because they've probably had to invest a lot of capital, for instance. So if they get another trigger at event at that stage, then they're in trouble. And then it consolidates over time. If it's not successful, they may go back to the active assessment stage. But if it is successful, then that becomes a new path dependency and they will stay on that trajectory until there's a good reason to shift off of it. So just getting into that in more detail, what I was talking about at the beginning has a lot to do with what I would consider to be cultural lock-in. So there's this cultural orientation to doing things in a certain way, to being a productive farmer. Getting out of farming or losing a lot of money at farming is something that has a lot of social stigma attached to it. So farmers will work very hard to ensure that they have a profitable, viable farming business, or at least a way to maintain the household that way. Maybe it's working off farm or what have you. But there's other reasons why they tend to follow a steady trajectory, and they're really quite sensible when you think about it. They're financial locked, financial lock-in. So they've probably invested a lot in the land that they have, for instance, and the buildings that they have. So if you're all set up for dairy, production, shifting to you know pig production or poultry production actually would take a huge amount of capital investment and you'd probably lose a lot of the money you originally invested. The same thing with the technology. If you're all set up to do intensive cereal production, you've got all these sprayers and things that you wouldn't be able to use if you shifted to organic farming. So that's going to make you reluctant to make that transition. You've got knowledge lock-in, which is what you know about how to farm. I grew up on a farm, so I have some idea what a healthy cow looks like and what a healthy pig looks like, because that's the farming background I have to happen to become from. Although when I went home to visit in the Christmas holidays, I still couldn't necessarily tell when a cow was about to give birth. That was actually a bit challenging. But my point is that if you know how to do a certain kind of agricultural production, learning how to do a whole different kind is going to take a lot of investment and probably take years of practical experience before you're anywhere near as competent at what you were doing earlier. Labor lock-in has more to do with labor, ability, labor availability. So in a lot of areas, there's a shortage of people who are competently trained to work on farms. So if you can't hire somebody else to work on your farm, then you're stuck with what's there. And if your children aren't coming through or you're not physically able anymore, then that's going to have an impact on the kind of things that you can do. You've also got land capability lock-in, and that just has to do with what your land is. There's no way in the world that some of these people farming on extensive um, kind of dairy operations, for instance, are going to be able to turn that into a cereal farm or horticulture. It just doesn't have the right land capability. And then last but not least is legal lock-in. And a lot of that has to do with land availability and tenancy and that sort of thing. That if you're a tenant farmer, which is quite common in the UK, then you're really going to struggle to try and put up new buildings or diversify your farming operation because it's not something necessarily that your landlord would let you do. So with all that said, it kind of makes you wonder why farmers would ever change their trajectory at all. And I would say that typically it's something that happens maybe once or twice over the course of a farm, farmer's sort of 40, 50 year tenure, if at all. So it's not a common event. But it does happen. You do get people converting to organic and you get people shifting into other things. 
And there's a couple of kind of major categories. Sometimes it's financial imperatives, and what I mean by that is just losing money. But not just losing money for one year. Farmers, by and large, won't make a change after one year unless things are really dire, because they've learned that a lot of commodity prices go in waves. So especially if you're in something like beef or dairy, where it takes years to build up a herd, then you're not going to get out after one year of bad milk prices unless things were pretty bad before that. You'll try and wait it out to return that investment that you have from the longer term. Intergenerational succession is another big trigger point. If you've got a son or a daughter coming into the business and suddenly you need to produce a second income or more income to provide for that household, then that will often make a difference to how you're running your farm or not. If it's actually a straightforward transition that happens gradually over time, the farm may continue on pretty much the same trajectory. So that one's not a guarantee. You do get a few entrepreneurial farmers who'll see an opportunity and think, oh, you know what, I should go for that. I would say that's fairly unusual, but it does happen. This isn't all passive, reactive farming. Farmers can be quite proactive as well. And then the last one is crisis of belief. And that's things like the BSE outbreak in the UK, for instance, had a big impact at the time of this study, where you get farmers looking at what they're doing in a way that they haven't really thought about it before. So they suddenly step back and think, OK, wait a minute, why are we feeding these proteins to cattle who are herbivores? Or start thinking about the way they've been producing in a way that they haven't before. And that's when you get a certain number converting to organic farming or doing something different. From a theoretical perspective, for people that are interested in the theory, what we call this is a shift from peripheral root processing to central root processing. So peripheral root processing is how you kind of make your day-to-day -day decisions that you don't really think that much about. So you maybe didn't think too much about what you put on this morning or what you had for breakfast or maybe even whether what you're doing for the weekend because it's routine sort of activity. And farmers get loads of information in through the post and into their email accounts. And a lot of it, that's what happens to it. They just sort of kind of randomly scan like you do and put it aside. And it may lodge in there somewhere. It's something to think about further down the road. But by and large, they don't give it a lot of active consideration. What you get where they've had a trigger event is they shift into central root processing. And that's actively considering things. That's the kind of thinking that you quite often put into, say, buying a new car, certainly into buying a new house, or changing jobs, for instance. You really think through the pros and cons, and can I do this, and what are my resources, and what are the impacts going to be? And that's the point where I think if you're looking to influence a change in farmer decision making, this is where the most effect can be had. So this is just some pictures, because I thought it was time for some pictures <laughs> of some of the different options that are open to farming. And this farmers are still somewhat locked in. So if you look at the picture of the wind turbines over there, for instance, if you've got someone who's having to make a change in their farming operation for financial reasons, chances are they can't afford to invest in that. So there are limits on what they can afford to do. If you've got something <laughs> like a diversification into local food, for instance, that might be more affordable, but this, bus this building obviously has taken some reconstruction and designing, and you need to have somebody to staff this. So if you're dealing with labor lock-in, then you're probably not going to be able to deal with this one as an option. This one down here with the robotic milkers I find quite fun because that's something that people actually do to keep a successor in the business, <laughs> not just because it's new technology, but actually one of the ways they can keep a successor or a young person in the business is by convincing them that they're not going to have to stand there and milk cows twice a day for the next 40 years. Actually, we'll get robotic milkers in, and they'll do that for you, and you can be more of a farm manager. So it's just interesting, the different kind of things that come into practice. And so after they've actively assessed these different options and decided what they might go for, and I should say, actually, that sometimes while well, uh, they're in this process of active assessment, the trigger disappears. The milk price goes back up again. And that just stops it. Uh, they may continue on now that they've thought of these options, but equally they might just go back to, well, OK, things are fine again, and go back to the way they were. But during the implementation phase, you see a lot of active knowledge seeking. You see them going to more events. You see them um, reading a lot more, talking to other farmers, and that sort of thing. You also see them kind of refining what their original plan was. So we had one guy, for instance, diversified into renting out some of his farm buildings as kind of retail space. And initially, he had sort of artisans in there. And what he found was that it wasn't reliable income. So they'd kind of come and try, and six months later, they'd be gone again. So he actually changed it into business space, where you get sort of accountants and business people in. And he found that was much more kind of steady income. So you get some tweaking of the different options that they go for. 
But it's also important, as I think I mentioned earlier, that this is a really vulnerable point in the cycle and that they are making a lot of investment into a new opportunity. So if that particular market disappears, for instance, then they might be in a lot of trouble. So what we had in the study were people that made the decision and they converted to organic farming, but they decided to wait until the conversion subsidy came in. Well, the problem was so did an awful lot of other people. So <laughs> then you have a lot of people to converting to organic farming right when the subsidy came in and then the prices just bottomed out. So you weren't getting anywhere near the premium for your product that they had banked on when they were making their plans. So it does require some adjustment. What happened in that particular case was that the subsidies, like the conversion subsidies, were five years. And so you would have had to pay them back if you pulled out at year two. And that actually kept a lot of people in until the prices went back up again and things started to sort themselves out. So then if things go well, then you go back to path dependency. And this is just a consolidation phase where you're just learning more. Things are actually going pretty smoothly. But you do decide if it's not working. And if it's not working, then you may go back and try again. So a lot of that um, didn't sound like it had a lot to do with the environment. And it didn't, it didn't, because as I said, you know, some of them were converting to organic farming, but by and large not for environmental reasons. In that particular case, it was very much kind of financially driven, and because it was in an area where there were a lot of kind of extensive production going on already, they didn't actually see that organic farming was going to make that much of a difference for the environment. But we do have some research that's demonstrating that certainly young people coming into the industry tend to have stronger environmental values and more of an orientation towards getting involved in agro-environmental schemes. Now that's a bit of a gross generalization and it does vary because there's also some evidence from Southern Europe in particular that young people coming in are much more kind of production oriented in terms of how they look at their farms. So you can't just kind of black and white it that way. But I thought in keeping with the kind of theme for today, I would talk a little bit about some of the more recent work that we've been doing on new entrants and successors. And it's pretty much widespread through the academic literature that having a successor in a farm business means that the business will grow and develop and expand. And they're not sure if that's because having the successor inspires the farmer to branch out in these different ways, or whether it's actually the successor themselves driving forward these kind of change processes. It's also possible that successors are a lot more likely to want to become a successor <laughs> if it's an economically viable farm because otherwise you're just looking at a life of poverty and that's not most young people's idea of a good lifestyle. And this particular research that I'm going to point you to, and there's going to be some fun graphs come up in a minute, was looking at the Eurostat figures. There's this kind of widespread idea throughout Europe that there is a shortage of young people coming into farming. Now, no one seems to know what the right number is. They just look at the number of older farmers and the number of younger farmers and say there's a big gap, so there must be a problem. So what we did was we had a look at the Eurostat figures to see, well, is there evidence you know, that young people are coming in or not? Is there evidence that they're actually this force for innovation and efficient farming that the European Commission likes to think that they are? And I must say <laughs> that the first thing we found out is that the numbers really are, I wouldn't say hopeless, <laughs> but there, there's a lot of challenges to using the Eurostat figures and coming up with, with reasonable outcomes when you're looking at young people. And that's because the statistics don't match up with the subsidy programs to start with. So if you want to get a, a grant as a young farmer to come in, you need to be under 40. Eurostat collects um, figures in decades that stop in five. So 35 and under, 35 to 45, 45 to 55. So we can't even accurately say how many farmers 40 and under there are in, the UK, in Europe, for instance. And they conflate them with sole holders. So there may well be a lot of successors coming onto farms in Europe, and they would not appear in the Eurostat figures at all, because the Eurostat figures go for what is identified as the primary farmer, and that tends to be the senior farmer, whether that person is the one actively running the farm or not. Plus, a lot of farmers don't retire until they're 65 or 75 years old, and if you're inheriting a farm, you're not likely going to inherit it necessarily before you're 40 years old. So we think that these numbers are probably missing quite a lot of successors, but it's impossible to know just how many successors are there. So all that being said, being academics, we use the numbers anyway. <laughs> and, and this is what we found. So that was kind of a caveat. Um, this is comparing holders that are under 35 years of age with those that are over 65 years of age. And it's probably not going to surprise you that much that across a variety of measures, the younger farmers come out as 
more active and more efficient. So that's utilized agricultural area, agricultural work units, and some subjective SO. It's about output, it's agricultural output anyway, the one in the middle, and then you've got one divided by the other and, and that sort of thing. And across this variety of measures at a really gross level, when you're looking at all the young farmers and all the older farmers, the young ones come out as a lot more efficient. Now part of that probably has to do with holders over 65 slowing down and going into kind of semi-retirement, which is pretty common on farms. But at the same time, your holders above 65 years of age may also have a 40-year-old successor or even a 35-year-old successor working in the business that we're just not aware of from looking at the statistics. But it's still quite interesting. Now this one, <laughs> I apologize, I first, when I first looked at this I was quite amazed. What this is, it, ex it looks at the number of farmers over the age of 65 in comparison to the number of farmers under the age of 65 in each of the countries. And then the size of the circle has to do with how much land is involved. So how big of an issue this is. So what this shows actually pretty convincingly is that these, um, oh this is where I wish I had a pointer. Oh there it is. These ones over here probably don't have a new entrant problem. Now this is national level statistics, so you have to be careful, there's maybe some regional ones going on, but actually the replacement rate of four farmers in that con those countries looks pretty healthy. You gotta figure there's probably going to be a few fewer farmers coming in because farms are getting bigger, so that's probably all right. And the replacement rates look okay. If you look over here, and the ones that are kind of this area, then these are the ones that could potentially have a problem. And again, potentially, because we don't know about the successors coming into the industry. So where Sweden is, there's Sweden right there. And so what that looks like is that based on the Eurostat statistics, you've got about 26% of your farmers over the age of 65, and only about 5% that are 35 and under. So that suggests that in the next sort of 10 or 20 years, you could have an issue, either maybe you'll have a lot of succession going on, this represents I think about 16% of Sweden's agricultural land, for instance. You could have a lot of succession, you could have farms getting bigger, you could have something happening, but there is an issue here at least that there doesn't look to be a lot of young soul holders coming into the industry. I should tell you the United Kingdom's worse, this is us right here, where we've got um, sort of 29% of our farmers are over the age of 65 and about 4% of new entrants coming in. And they think that has to do with the really high land values. So farmers just aren't willing to hand on their farms to the next generation until the very last minute. Because it does look to be from a lot of kind of more internal UK analysis that we've done uh, that actually there are a lot of successors. Portugal, on the other hand, over here, definitely comes off as the worst. And what we see in terms of a theme from a lot of these countries is that these tend to be countries that have a lot of small-scale agricultural units. So not completely, obviously here in the UK, uh, sorry, where I'm from in the UK, there are a lot of kind of larger scale holdings, I understand in southern Sweden as well, but certainly a lot of southern Europe falls in this category, and what you've got are a lot of really small, really inefficient, small scale holdings that are still being managed by older farmers. So I'm gonna leave you to make what you will of that and shift into this one. This is the EIP Agri Focus Group uh, that I'm working on, looking at new entrants to farming. The European Commission in the last couple of years has come out with a new way of doing research, and this is one of the aspects of it. So what they do is they come up with a bunch of topics, and I think they've done 16 or 20 so far, of which this is one, that they think is of interest, research interest, but they don't actually know very much about. So what they do is they gather a group of experts from across Europe to come together and just try and figure out what do we actually know. So the group doesn't actually do any research, they just bring together the literature and the practical experience to find out what we think we already know. And then they use that as a platform for either designing interventions or asking for more formal kind of research processes. So in this particular case, the experts involved, I think, seven or eight academics, but also seven or eight farmers, and then sort of seven or eight practitioners. So people involved in advising new entrants and that sort of thing to get us all together to talk about, so what do we know about new entrants? And I should clarify, when they're talking about new entrants here, 
what they're talking about are actually what they call ex novo new entrants. So new entrants with no experience whatsoever of farming. And that's actually pretty unusual. So that's one of the things we had to point out to them that yes, okay, there potentially are some people coming into the, in into the industry with no experience, but chances are they have something. People don't make that leap in the dark without at least having seen a goat or petted a sheep or attended a livestock show. And a lot of them, you know, are accessing land through relatives. So maybe they didn't grow up on the farm, but their dad did, or their cousins did, or there's farm land somewhere in the family that they can access, for instance. Or they have some kind of background that they're bringing with them. So we convinced them to broaden it a bit, but it is still, by and large, kind of these ex novo new entrants. And what we're finding is, Something that was quite surprising to me, we all know that there's a lot more kind of organic farming, short food chains, that sort of thing happening in agriculture, particularly um, further south where it's easy to easier to grow a wide variety of things. But actually, these new entrants that have very little experience, that aren't direct successors, are almost entirely coming in uh, as part of these alternative approaches to farming. And that's not just because they're hippies that want to change the world, although to be fair, you know, some of them are. <laughs> But there's also a really practical aspect to that, and that is that if you're coming in without the resources of inheriting a farm behind you, you can't afford to start up in conversional, commercial conventional mainstream agriculture with sort of 600 hectares and buy a new tractor and put up sheds and all that kind of stuff. Those millions in investment are probably beyond you. So what they have to do is produce a high value product with very few resources on a very small land base. So there's an awful lot of horticulture, for instance, happening in this kind of area. There's also a lot of really innovative, interesting ways to get into farming that are happening. And I think the European Commission's right to want to look at this group with a view to where can farming go in the future. Because there's some really exciting ideas going on about how you can access things through share farming or having, you know, selling shares in a cow and then returning the milk to people or incubators where you protect farms for a small period of time while they're developing and getting involved in their markets and cooperatives and all kinds of really interesting things that I think actually successors to a farming business could really benefit from, not just as a way to develop their own farm, but as a way to deal with some of the barriers that come along with succession. So if you've got three kids, for instance, and you're one of them wants to farm, or maybe two of them want to farm, to hand on a viable farm often means paying out the third sibling. And where are you going to get that money from? So some of these ideas can be really interesting for how you can transfer this resource to the next generation and, su and su um, successfully set up a business. Uh, so I'm going to leave it there, I think. That was, I was going to leave you with a nice picture of, of Scotland. This is um <laughs> the island of... Sky, I think. Um, yeah, that there's a really interesting future out there for farming, and I'm glad that we're here to talk about it today. <laughs>